Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Thank you for joining us for our final world's most exciting classroom event of 2023. Some classes, like in the UK, have already gone out on their holidays. Canada, North America, and other places will be going out on Friday. So we'll take a little pause over the holidays as the ship, the Oosterskelde, is making its way to the Falklands. And then right away, January 8th, we are going to be right back with you. And we're planning a series of live events from the Falklands. It should be pretty incredible. Penguins, elephant seals, sea lions, albatross, uh, and so much more. We'll try and get live in the field with our satellite units, with our cameras, and we'll try and bring you some pretty uh, incredible stuff from the Falklands. So last event from uh, for 2023, world's most exciting classroom. We have lots to do today. A little bit later, we are going to visit uh, the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth with the Ocean Conservation Trust. They've got a great experiment lined up for us. We're going to talk a little bit about climate change uh, and how we can reduce our carbon footprints. The ship right now has, is in uh, Puerto Madryn. Last week, if you remember, we were live with Magellanic penguins uh, in the penguin colony in Patagonia in Argentina. So the ship is in Puerto Madryn. And as we speak, they're literally pulling up the anchor and they're going to about to start sailing for the Falklands. But lucky for us, we have two amazing guest speakers with us, Darwin leaders, camera folks uh, on board the ship doing amazing things. So I'm going to bring in, we've got Luca and Nico backstage with us, familiar faces. Uh, oh, we might have just lost some of the satellite signal. So, oh, there we go. They're coming back in. Let's see if it clears up for us. Hey, Luca. Hey, Nico. How you hey guys there. doing? Hi, hello, hello how are you? Really good here on the Osterhelder. All right, it is so great to see you both. It seems like, it doesn't feel that long ago, I was with you guys in Rio and we had a ton of fun in Rio. Uh, but let's just take a minute and just update us. What have you guys been up to since Rio? I know it's a lot, but maybe tell us a little bit about what you guys have gotten up to. Oh, you went to Rio to Punta del Este. Oh yeah, since, since Rio. So um, we went to Rio. Uh, it was pretty fun. It was uh, smooth sailing, more or less. Um, and then in Punta del Este in Uruguay, we had a eight Darwin leader project. So I think that's the most Darwin leaders we had in one port till now. Um, we had some on the Darwin toad, which is uh, an endemic toad species that uh, Darwin researched in Uruguay, as well as other projects like um, uh, we had some on beaches, on the conservation of beaches. Uh, I myself filmed um, the conservation of grasslands, uh, which many people don't know about, uh, then many other projects on on other other animals as well. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a really exciting week because um, just how many people were on board was, was the most Star One leaders at once, so the energy was great. We was playing also with the ROV, and we were seeing some sea lions, and we were like, seeing some so much animals in there. And after we get to the Patagonia, uh, now we are here in Puerto Madryn. I was working with the steamer duck project. I was a Darwin leader. Uh, here I changed. I was a camera operator in another leg as uh, Fernando Noronha, Rio de Janeiro, and Salvador. And now I was a Darwin leader. And I was studying the steamer duck and was so cool. We went to Camarones, three hours away drive uh, to here. And we was studying the species with different biologists and scientists. And um, after getting so much fun, also diving with the sea lions and understanding more the ecosystem from the Patagonia. And um, just yesterday, we went to see the commerce on dolphins. So we was getting so much fun, seeing so much animal, uh, knowing a lot, a lot, a lot of information. And now going to going to the Malvinas, going to the Falklands. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have been having an absolutely incredible time. Uh, and Nico, in a, a couple of minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about your Darwin Leader project. But Luca, I want to focus in on the ROV for a couple of minutes. So we've got the ROV on board. We tested it out on the way to Uruguay. We threw it in the water for some scientists and looked at uh, a seamount that they're hoping to have protected in the future. So that was pretty cool. But then you were able to, to use it in Puerto Madryn and you had a, a special visitor come and play with it for a little bit. Definitely, yeah. Um, should we pull up footage or should I? Should I talk about it first? Yeah, I'm going to pull up the footage because uh, there's no sound, so it's perfect if you kind of talk over it a little bit. Definitely. Yeah. So we're anchored. We're still anchored in uh, Puerto Madryn right now. And at anchor, uh, I decided to plop the ROV in the water since the water was pretty calm. And um, this is the seafloor. So 
Um, I screen recorded it. You're able to see um, all the statistics on the left hand bottom corner. Um, so as you can see, we're 10 meters deep. Uh, the water is about 15 degrees. And um, this, this is pretty much what the ROV is seeing right now. So I'm, I was on the boat controlling it from the boat and then it was tethered with a 100 meter cable to the seafloor. So right now we see a bunch of crabs or uh, like crayfish like animals. Um, we're still working on IDing them. Um, but then after, after filming those, we had a special visitor, as you can see right here, one of the um, local sea lions uh, came to play with the ROV. Uh, so he was very curious because um, uh, for him, it was probably, or for her, it was probably the first time seeing a yellow submarine underwater. So, um, you know, it came up uh, to kind of uh, scout, scout it out, uh, as you'll see in a second. Uh, yeah, right here. You can see it's trying to like look for food or something as well. And then it sees the lights of the camera, starts sniffing them. Um, and it was it was really cool uh, filming underwater because it just popped out of nowhere. You know, obviously the visibility isn't too great, so we're just filming the bottom. And then suddenly she she comes out of out of nowhere. Did you, Luca? Did you know the sea lion was in the water, or was it a complete surprise? No, it was a complete surprise. So the sea lion has been around before. The night before, it was kind of checking out the boat, trying to hop on the boat. Um, uh, but I didn't see it that day. So, so once I put it in the water, the sea lion must have noticed it or something, and then then swam over to check it out. Oh, that's so cool. I can't wait. I think, I, I hope we can get it in the water at every port because, uh, you know, this footage is so different from the footage on the seamount in Uruguay where we saw schools of fish and uh, maybe the water was a little bit clearer. We saw the rocky bottom. And then here we are further down the coast and we're getting this different view with those little crab-like creatures kind of scurrying along the bottom. We've got our, our sea lion friends. So, uh, I think it's going to be fun to throw the ROV in in the different ports, and then especially South Pacific. We should get some amazing coral uh, totally. footage. Yeah, that would be great. And yeah, it's amazing how much life is on the sea floor. You know, given that it's just in in the port, like a few a couple hundred meters off the coast here in the bay. Were, were you fighting a little bit of a current? It looks like the ROVs yeah. kind of pulled backwards a little bit in some of the yeah, shots. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a surge. Um, yeah, you can definitely tell there's there's a current, um, which makes it tricky sometimes, uh, especially since the comp. So like since the boat is made out of steel, you can't yep. calibrate the compass on the boat. So I have no sense of direction. It's kind of just me, me hoping I'm going in the right right direction, of, you know, away from the boat, and then the way back I'll haul the cable. Um, yeah, towards the boat. There's another crab species there. That one's pretty curious. Yeah, yeah. We'll still have to ID them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, this is, and then there's, this is it looks like a beautiful river. sunset that night too. Uh, yeah, we took down <laughs> for a for sunset snor uh, snorkel. So this is now a different footage uh, yeah. from the same place, but it looks completely different. And this yeah. was after it rained for two days and it was just full of kelp, as you can see, full of kelp mussels and stuff. So I'm not sure if the boat was just maybe anchored in a slightly next to where we shot the RIV at first or if all the nutrients from the rain, for, you know, help, help the kelp have this massive in a few days because you know as you probably know kelp can grow a couple centimeters per day um, so yeah kelp's incredible yeah yeah some kelp species like off the coast of california even as much as a meter it's it's amazing there's totally. rodri <laughs> yeah. very very cool well that is that is such great footage i'm so glad you were able to send that through i know the classrooms are gonna have a blast uh checking that out so luca thank you so much that's um Again, you're you're having an incredible experience. I remember we first connected with you in Salvador when you were a Darwin leader, totally. uh, and you've been able to really kind of get in with the team, be a camera operator, and and really contribute some amazing stuff to the project. So, thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Luca. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I hope we can uh, check the RV in, in further ports as well. So. Oh, absolutely. And so, Nico, okay, you are usually behind the camera, uh, and this week we had you as a as a Darwin leader. How was that experience? Oh, that, that was amazing because it's completely different. When you're a camera operator, you're always like filming the thing and you are on the same place, but you are behind the cameras, as you said. But now I was like more like the actor, more the protagonist. Um, so yes, and I got the chance to go with Josh, the other camera yeah. operator. We get the chance also uh, to be in the most attacking classroom a few, few months ago. Um, I was documenting there the, the flightless steamer deck. Um, one of the really cool things is 
uh, the flightless steamer that is just here, like on the Patagonia Argentina, and is sharing also with the Patagonia with the Chilean side. Um, I get the chance to see more than 40 of them with Maria Laura Guero. It was uh, my local expert here from the CONICET and the SEMPAT is one of the biggest also um, conservation and science and science centers in the world. And is one in Argentina. Um, yes, and we went to Camarones, three hours drive to here. Uh, we get the expedition there and we were seeing a lot of a lot of steamer decks and we was filming there and we was making interviews with the rangers we were spending two days sleeping on the uh, rangers house so it was really was really amazing oh wow it sounds amazing nico why don't yeah. we check out your first video and then we'll ask a few questions yeah of course let's see all right here we go it's take me a second to load it and we should be live yeah you will enjoy it a lot <laughs> ¿Cómo me van a decir que la magia no existe? ¡Bienvenidos! ¡Esta es la expedición de mi vida! Hola, yo soy Nico Marín, fotógrafo submarino, explorador de National Geographic y Darwin Leader. A lo largo de los años, he quedado maravillado por la forma de explorar de Charles Darwin. Más allá de su increíble sabiduría, pienso que personas como él revolucionaron el mundo por su poder de observación. Por eso, me vine a un rincón mágico en el planeta a observar la vida como él en sus tiempos. La Patagonia. En estas aguas, se encuentra una de las especies más importantes para el ecosistema patagónico. El pato vapor. Si como explorador la gente ha quedado maravillada con mis tomas de orcas, ballenas, pero siempre animales grandes. Pero, ¿cómo hacemos para llegar a que la gente entienda qué tan importante puede ser un pato? Bueno, en principio, son más que simples patos. Mi nombre es María Laura Güero, soy bióloga y trabajo en CONICET, en, específicamente en el Instituto de Centro de Estudios para Sistemas Marinos del CEMPAT en Puerto Madrid. Bueno, el pato vapor es, no es un pato común y corriente porque es un pato que a lo largo de todo el mundo tiene un gran grado de endemismo, porque es el único lugar en el mundo donde está, es acá. Hay cuatro especies de pato vapor, y las cuatro son endémicas de la parte sur de Patagonia. Y esta específicamente, el pato vapor cabeza blanca no volador, es endémico de las costas de, de Chubut. Para entender más y entender su comportamiento, nos fuimos de expedición a Camarones. Nos despertamos, preparamos los equipos Y salimos a la aventura. Laura nos contaba que en el pasado 
nadie tenía información sobre esta especie, porque nadie los estudiaba y estaba catalogada como una especie sin peligro. Por suerte, gracias a su estudio de más de 10 años, ella pudo catalogar su población, identificar rangos de edad y mucho más. En los próximos capítulos profundizaremos más acerca de las problemáticas que enridan al pato vapor. Y cómo hoy en día los líderes locales ayudan a la conservación de esta especie. No te pierdas ni un episodio. Nos vemos en el próximo capítulo. All right. Nico, what a great video. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. Looks like you got some great footage. Oh, can you grab the mute, guys? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, we was having a really great time there. We was uh, getting a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, really good experience. So, yes, and was nice because it was my first time seeing the steamer duck. I was a lot yeah. of times being here in the Patagonia, you know, seeing the right whales, the orca, the elephant seal, and the sea lions, but I never was focused on the steamer duck. And now I was studying uh, the steamer duck and was so cool. Oh, amazing. So if you're tuning in, I can see we have lots of people tuning in via YouTube uh, and Facebook. So send us a message in the chat if you want to ask a question. I've got a question here from a class in Canada, Nico, and they're wondering what you found most challenging about coming out from behind the camera to do the to do the, the video this week. Oh, uh, one of the big challenges was I really like to be in front of camera because as uh, Nico Marine, I also uh, make like a character, you know, like uh, with different personality, with uh, like kind of uh, a host to the, be a host TV show or something like that. Was also one of my biggest dreams, always being on a TV show and maybe like present animals and that stuff. And now like my dreams come true. And now I could present the, the steamer duck in this case, that species that was so cool. Um, I think the biggest challenge was like maybe now being in front of camera and make the script in front of camera and not behind. Because when you are behind the camera, you are more like a, a producer, you are like editor and you know. Maybe. But when you work with a camera operator, the camera operator have their own eye and you need like to be just you. And the camera operator will film you in every in every area. So I think that was the, the most difficult challenge, but we, we, we were taking it. All right. I've got a question here from a classroom in Virginia, uh, and they would like to know what makes steamer ducks different from maybe a, a, a regular duck you'd see in a lake or something or a river. Okay. Yeah. The, the steamer duck specifically is a, they have a really high level of, of endemism. So it's not a duck you can see maybe in the north of I don't know, Alaska or in the States or in Africa or in Australia. You can see this duck just in the Patagonia and in the Patagonian side of Chile. Um, one of the really like cool things maybe is this a flyless steel uh, duck. So this duck is not fly. Um, and you can different the males from the females because the, the females have like a line uh, next to the eyes and the males have like a white uniform head um one of the of the good thing is here on one of the national parks in argentina the steamer duck is uh, the first like um animal in the logo so for here for the patagonian side it's really important for the ecosystem because uh, 10 years ago before laura agüero the girl you were seeing on the video no one was studying the steamer duck but it was because no one had a study and no one was interested in and now after nowadays after the laura studies now the steamer duck is really uh, protected. And now they have like uh, different population senses and they are like documenting every day with the rangers. The rangers are going, taking notes every day about the population and the different gender, the nest. So that, that's a principal difference. Like it's yeah. just in the Patagonia, Argentina and Chile. All right. And on the, Fol the Falklands also. So now we can see maybe um, a little bit more of the steamer ducks. Okay. So Beth and Miles are in the UK and they want to know about how big is a steamer duck? Oh, okay. Mm, depends because the, the males can be a little bit bigger from the females, but when they are uh, a really cool thing is they, they born like uh, ready to go to the ocean, like a different okay. of the penguin of the penguins. They, they are born with the closed eyes and the steamer ducks are already with the big eyes open. 
and the legs really strong. So they are ready to go to the ocean uh, two days uh, after they born and catch their own food. And so they are ready to go diving and catch their own food. But after they are growing and growing and growing, maybe they can get like. All right. You froze on us just for a second, Nico. You said yeah. maybe about this big. Does that seem about right? Yeah, like about like 45 centimeters or okay. something like that. So, and yes, and the babies, when they are born, then the first day they are ready to go to the ocean. So you can see the nest. They put the nest really close to the ocean to go straight to the ocean and catch their own food because the father and the mother, they will not be able to come with food. They need to go to, for their own food. All right. And Luca, we got a question here for you about the ROV. You've probably flown drones before. Is it similar or is it more challenging? Um, it's, it's definitely very similar. The controls, like uh, the same with the drone, you have two knobs, you know, one to go up, down, turn, and then one um, to go forward, back, sideways. And then you have some other knobs as well to uh, change the angle. So yeah, it's, it's similar to the drone, but the main challenge is really that it's tethered, right? Because the drone um, is over reception or whatever, so you don't you don't need to have a cable connected to it. I don't think that would really work. But with the underwater one, since um, it's kind of harder for waves to travel underwater, you need to have a cable. And then that makes it, of course, challenging um, trying try not to get the cable stuck anywhere or anything, but it's also useful because uh, the other challenge is the currents. You don't yeah. you obviously have the wind in the air, so it's kind of the equivalent of wind. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of times the currents will be a lot stronger. Um, so if they do end up being too strong and start kind of you know pushing the ROV away from the boat, um, the cable is really useful because you can kind of reel it in. You know. Yeah. Uh, so if there were no cable, you would definitely risk losing it. Oh, for sure. With the drone, usually you can visually see it, depending on how far away you go. But once that drone goes underwater, you're kind of, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Different, yeah, once you go story. one, two meters deep, it's, it's gone, you know, then you're just looking at the screen. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Luca uh, and Nico, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I know your safety briefing is starting soon. Uh, I, I absolutely cannot wait for the Falklands. I think we're going to have an amazing event series, and you guys are going to have an absolute blast there. Yeah, we will share with you guys about the trip to the Falklands. Maybe we'll see some whales, elephant seals, penguins. Definitely. We don't know. So, yes, we are really excited to, yeah. to be there and now sailing. So yeah. We saw yeah. an orca on the last leg, so hopefully we'll see a bunch more whales now uh, moving forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd yeah. be amazing. So, All thank right. you, Joe. Safe travels, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. Right. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Bye. -bye. Yeah. All right. See you guys. All right. So there we go, Nico uh, and Luca hanging out with us today, and they are just moments away from a safety briefing, and then the Uster Scale Day uh, will be leaving Puerto Madryn and making its way over the next couple weeks, over the holidays, to the Falklands, and then we should have some incredible event series coming up the week uh, of January the 8th. All right, we have our guests joining us today. Uh, those who have followed the world, world's most exciting classroom know that we have spent a few sessions with the... Uh, National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth with the Ocean Conservation Trust. And they've done an incredible series for us, ranging from hanging out with uh, their octopus, Barbara, to uh, feeding the sharks and going behind this stage. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time with Georgia. So I'm going to bring her in live with us right now. Hey, Georgia, how are you? Hello, I'm good. Thank you, Jane. Um, so we, we're not out in the aquarium today, we're actually in our learning centre. So this is normally where we bring school groups when they come on school trips and we do workshops and we teach them all about the ocean and ocean problems. So what we're going to be talking about today is all about connecting those dots between why we always say you should turn your lights off when you're not using them and how that links to climate change. So we're going to start off by talking about electricity. And loads of us all over the world, we rely on electricity for so many things. Whatever you're watching us on right now, your computer screen, your phone screen, that requires electricity. The lights in the room, maybe when you're preparing your food, all of that requires electricity. And a lot of our electricity comes from a fossil fuel power station. 
So here I've got a little model that I'm going to talk through and it's all about where our electricity comes from. Now a fossil fuel is basically a fuel that we use, it includes coal, oil and natural gas and those fuels take millions of years to develop. So they come from dead animals and plants that died a really long time ago and then because of lots of uh, high pressures and high temperatures, it converted those dead animals and plants into those fossil fuels, which we then dig up and we use them in power stations, uh, like I'm gonna show you this model in a minute, to generate electricity. So on our little model, I'm gonna show you how this works and I'm gonna explain how we generate electricity in real life. So in this little container, I have got an alcohol. It's called isopropanol. And this is representing our fossil fuel. So in real life, we would be burning uh, a fossil fuel like coal, oil, or natural gas. So I'm gonna light this. And it works a little bit like uh, a candle. So there's a wick inside here that draws that alcohol up and then that is burning. And I'm just going to pop this on here, which is our model power station. And in a real power station, what would happen is when we burn this fuel, it would be underneath a really big container of water. It would heat up that water, causing it to turn from a liquid into a gas, into steam. That steam would then go through the power station and it would go to what we call a turbine. And a turbine is just a base, basically a fancy word for a big fan. And that turbine is connected to an electricity generator. And the electrical generator is like a really big magnet with wires coiled around it. And then as that turns, it generates the electricity. Now, our model here doesn't have all of those parts, but it works in a very similar way. So now I've given it a little bit of time to get warmed up. I can get it going. There we go. And it definitely just needs a little bit more time. So we'll just give it a couple of seconds longer. We just need to get this area to heat up a little bit more. But when we're burning our fuel, our fuel is undergoing a special chemical reaction. Now, I wonder if anyone at home or anyone at school can think of what the scientific word is when we burn a fuel. The word begins with a C, See if you can think of it. If you're in the class, you maybe pop your hand up and tell your teacher and see if you can think of that scientific word for burning a fuel. If you said combustion, then really well done. It is combustion. So there we go, it's getting going now. So we are having combustion take place with our fuel. And that's what happens to those fossil fuels in a real power station. And when a fuel undergoes combustion, it's reacting with a certain gas in the air. Now again, at home, at school, see if you can think of what gas that is. What gas in the air is our fuel reacting with when it is burning? If you said oxygen, then well done you. It is reacting with oxygen. And we have generated some electricity. Now, this electricity would go from our power stations, along big cables, uh, maybe overground or underground, to our homes and buildings. And when it gets to our homes and buildings, we can use that electricity for our power in our homes. So we might need some lights. Have a think and see if you can come up with some ideas of things in your homes or in your schools that you need lights for or that you need electricity for to power the light. Now, you might have said maybe a TV screen or perhaps a computer screen. They all require light. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect, if it works, it's a little bit broken, it's a little bit fiddly, but I'm gonna connect this light bulb to our circuit and hopefully we will see some light. There we go, a little flicker there, I accidentally touched it a tiny bit. There we go. So with our power station, we've generated some electricity and this has given us some light in our light bulb. Just like what happens when the electricity goes from a real power station to our homes to power our lights. Now, we don't just need electricity for lights. 
we need it for other things instead, including sound. So at home or at school, see if you can think of some things in your homes or in your schools that we use electricity for to produce sound. Have a little think, see what ideas you can come up with. And you might have thought of maybe things like a telephone or maybe a microwave when it beeps, when it's ready, or again a TV that produces sound as well. So I'm going to connect up this buzzer. And hopefully on your own, you can also hear this really annoying noise coming from this buzzer. And again, this is being powered by our power station. Now, I'm going to play this up. And have a think about what's going to happen now. What's going to happen if our fuel is no longer burning? We can see our power station is starting to slow down. We're generating less electricity. And the sound is starting to go off. And if you think about in real life, if something happens to our power station or something happens uh, trans, uh, taking our electricity from our power station to our homes and buildings, that's what can happen. We can have a power cut, so we can have problems there. Now, this is a fossil fuel power station. So remember, those fossil fuels are coal, oil and natural gas. Now, there are other ways we can generate electricity. We can use renewable forms of energy instead. And we'll think a little bit more about that at the end of our session. Now, when we have things like cars or planes or buses, they also require power. But they don't need a little flame like this. In fact, they need a really big explosion. OK, so in a car, there are actually hundreds of mini explosions happening every second to make your car move. And that's what we're going to look at next. So I'm going to move over there and we're going to have a go at doing a little explosion. Now, in here, I have got some of that alcohol in it. It's called isopropanol. And I'm going to shake it up in this bottle. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to turn it into a vapour, into a gas. And then in a minute, I'm going to light it. And hopefully, we will get a big explosion. Now, in the bottle, there isn't just the alcohol. There's something else in the bottle as well. Can anyone think at home or at school, what else is inside the bottle? What am I mixing the alcohol with? Now, if you said it is air, or if you said it is oxygen, then fantastic job, it is indeed. I'm trying to mix my fuel with the oxygen in the air, just like we did a minute ago with our model power station. And then, hopefully, if I've done this enough, we will get a little explosion. Now, I don't want that excess isopropanol, so I'm gonna pour the rest of that out. I just want the vapour. I don't want any of that liquid left over. So I'm just going to make sure I have poured as much of that out as possible. And then I'm just going to pop the lid on just to trap any of that vapour so it doesn't escape. And then, I don't want to be too close when I light our vapour. So I've got a very scientific piece of equipment here. I've got a metre stick with a split attached to the end of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to light the split, then I'm going to take the lid off the bottle, and hopefully we will get an explosion. And the reason this is called a whoosh bottle is because it makes a whoosh noise as it catches a light. So keep your fingers crossed and we'll see if it works. It did, it did make that much of a noise, but it did work really, really well. In fact, it actually took quite a long time for that vapour to catch a light. And that shows you how much energy, how much chemical energy 
is stored in our fuels that we use, like this alcohol. Okay? Now, I'm going to move over to this area now, and I'm going to explain what I've got these coloured uh, sections here all about. Now, a couple of weeks ago, my friend Becky, who also works here at Sea Aquarium, she did a little session about ocean pH. And if you didn't watch that, then do not worry, because I'll fill you in and remind you of what you might have missed. Now, the pH scale, shown by these bright colours on the side here, they are what tell you how acidic or how alkaline a liquid is. Now, the scale goes from 1 or from 0 all the way up to 14. And you can add a liquid called universal indicator to other liquids to tell you what the pH is. Now, here I've got some water from our taps. And when I added universal indicator to it, it went green. And that tells us it is in the middle on our pH scale. It is about a pH 7, and that tells us that it's neutral. However, when Becky did the experiment a few weeks ago, she had a little competition where she had different animals and different people blowing carbon dioxide out of their mouths into the water, just like what is happening in our oceans. So when we burn a fuel, when we burn a fuel in our power station, or when we burn a fuel in our cars, like we showed you a minute ago with that whoosh bottle explosion, a certain gas carbon dioxide is being released and lots of that gas goes out into our atmosphere that blanket of gases around the earth however about 50 percent of it actually goes into our oceans and becky showed us how when that carbon dioxide goes into our oceans so when we blow into this water it actually turns our oceans more acidic so when we blow from our mouths out into the water, it made the water turn a more orangey red colour because it was turning more acidic. And that is what is happening in our oceans. And this can be a problem for lots of animals. So we're just going to move along to this bit. So here I have got quite a lot of artefacts of animals that have what we call a calcium carbonate skeleton. So, or exoskeleton. So here we've got a lobster, we've got some animals that live in shells, like this beautiful nautilus shell, and we have got some beautiful coral skeletons. And all of these are made of that calcium carbonate. And in a session I did a couple of weeks ago, I explained how when that carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, it can affect how strong these animals' skeletons are. Now, there's a little experiment that you could do at school or at home to represent what happens when our animals are living in an acidic ocean. Now, all you need is really simple, is a little film canister like this and fill it with some white vinegar, half fill it with white vinegar. And then you want to take an Alka-Seltzer tablet like this, it's basically just a fizzy tablet, break one in half, and what you're going to do is very safely is you are going to pop your tablet into the canister, put the lid back on and then turn the canister upside down, pop it on a hard surface and move well away and then you should get an explosion. And when we've done this before here at the aquarium, often the explosion actually hits the ceiling, it's so big. And when you look at the tablet afterwards, you can see that the tablet will have broken down. And that is representing what happens if our animals with calcium carbonate skeletons or shells are put into an acidic environment. It makes their skeletons or their shells really weak and it causes them to break down slowly. Now, our oceans are not going to explode, just a disclaimer there, but this experiment is a really nice way that you can do at home or at school to uh, kind of explore how the acidic environment can affect our wonderful animals. Now, our last bit of our session is talking about what we can do to help the ocean and reduce the effects of climate change. So Andrew's just going to move the camera very quickly. 
whilst we get into our next position. Perfect. So in our session today, we have spoken about how we have our power stations, they have fossil fuels which they burn, and when we burn a fuel like coal, oil, or natural gas, it releases carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. That sometimes can go into our oceans and affect our wonderful animals that live there that have calcium carbonate shells or skeletons. Now, we mentioned earlier that there are actually nicer, much more friendly ways for the environment that we can generate electricity. So we call those renewable energy sources. They include things like solar panels or wind turbines or hydrothermal energy, and those are renewable energy sources. But there are many things that us as individuals can do as well to reduce our impact of climate change. And the first one is all about transport. Now, I doubt many of the viewers here have their own car, but I'm sure lots of you will ask your family or your guardians for lifts to your friends' houses. Now, we're not saying that you can never drive again, but what you could do is you could just try and walk a little bit more if your friend's house is nice and close, then rather than going in the car, you could walk or you could get a bus or you could cycle instead. And that will reduce how much carbon dioxide is being emitted into our atmosphere. Now, the second thing that you can do relates to what we're buying. Now, lots of things we buy have plastic packaging. And I'm joined by my wonderful friend, Andrew, who has got some plastic attire. I'm looking very, very fashionable. He's got a lovely wig on as well. Now, plastic comes from oil. And producing, uh, sorry, producing plastic that happens in factories also uh, releases lots of carbon dioxide as well. So our second thing we can do is just to buy less plastic packaging or try and reuse or recycle plastics if we've got them. Now, the third thing we can do, again, is about what we buy. And Andrew, in fact, with us, he's had an outfit change, and now he's got a wonderful marine-themed shirt on. Now, we all love to look fashionable, but often we buy too many clothes. And often what we're doing is we're buying clothes that are from fast fashion. And this is where we're buying clothes that are maybe made quite cheaply, and we're buying it too frequently. And the factories that produce these clothes, they are also emitting lots of carbon dioxide. So our next thing we can do is just to reduce how many clothes we buy or to buy more sustainable brands. Now, the fourth thing we can do, I said at the start, a lot of us probably leave light switches on. And we were gonna fill in those gaps as to why we shouldn't do that anymore. Now, and he's got another outfit change, and he's now got a high vis jacket on. He is resembling a light switch. And loads of us, as I mentioned, we leave light switches on when we should just turn them off if we're not in the room. Or TVs or Xboxes, we just need to turn them off so they're not wasting that electricity. So that's what I'm going to do with Andrew. I'm just going to pop this up, and I'm going to switch the lights off. Okay? So super, super simple. Very, very nice. Thank you very much, Andrew. And the last thing that we can do is about what we're eating. Now, we are not saying that you can never eat animal or meat products ever again, but lots of animal produce releases lots of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. So, Andrew, he's had his best outfit change yet. He's now in a hot dog costume because we are talking about eating meat. And eating meat, as I said, release, it can release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or methane, which is a similar gas. So what we can do for our last way to reduce our carbon footprint is just to eat a little bit less meat and be a bit more mindful about what produce we are buying and eating. So, thank you so, so much for joining us here today. We hope that you have enjoyed seeing our experiment and you've learned a few bits and we hope that you have a fantastic Christmas. Back over to you, Jay. All right. Georgia, thank you so much for that incredible series. 
uh, yeah. of experiments for taking us into the world of fossil fuels, uh, the impact of carbon dioxide entering our oceans, uh, and then of course, um, talking a little bit about how we can reduce our carbon footprints. And a shout out to Andrew for being a wonderful camera person today and, and a great hot dog, uh, I must say. Amazing. So a quick question for you, Georgia, before um, we let you go. And just uh, a quick question about ocean acidification. And yeah. I was just wondering if that impacts coral reefs and, and what that's like, how it impacts coral. It absolutely does, Sue. So, uh, coral reefs are super important habitats. And because our oceans are becoming more acidic, it, it is basically uh, that ocean acidification is damaging that calcium carbonate skeleton that, the, that protects the animals in the coral, the polyps. And if that happens, then the coral habitat will become more fragile, it will start to break down, and then the animals that live there, that call it their home, they won't be able to live there anymore. So uh, that plus bleaching, those two impacts that are uh, happening to corals, uh, we can do those different activities like reducing our meat consumption, turning our light bulbs off, uh, we can encourage people to use renewable energy, and all of those things will help to reduce the impact on corals. All right. Well, Georgia, thank you so much. A huge shout out to you and all the others at the aquarium who hung out with us, like Becky Thanks. and Stu. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great holiday season. We can't wait to, to see Ocean Conservation Trust again in the new year. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Jay. All right. Thank you. All right. Another great visit uh, with Ocean Conservation Trust and the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. It really has been fun. Uh, they've been with us really since day one, our, our launch event in Plymouth. We had Becky on the ship uh, and she introduced the aquarium and the great work uh, that they do there with Ocean Conservation Trust. So we have a few more things to do before we wrap up today and we're gonna have our quick Kahoot quiz now. I can see several classes uh, have joined us already. I'm going to pop up the information here for how you can join the Kahoot. Just bear with me for one moment, make sure I pick the right screen. Perfect. So you can see we have several classrooms in there already. Uh, if you are joining from home, you could join on your own uh, with your phone or your tablet, scan that QR code, or go to kahoot.it and enter 555-1613. If you have one-to-one -one technology, some classrooms have tablets or Chromebooks they can use at their desk. Students could join that way. They could join right uh, at their desk. Otherwise, I know many teachers join with it at the front of their room and your classes or your students can shout out your answers uh, to select. So I think I have five questions today that I pulled together really quickly. A couple questions about steamer ducks from when we were hanging out with Nico, and then a, a couple questions about fossil fuels and the burning of fossil fuels from our time with Georgia uh, and the Marine National Aquarium and Ocean Conservation Trust. Um, to wrap up today, we will also see our results of the experiment. We're growing our crest seeds. And then we have a brand new experiment to show with uh, uh, today that ties in very nicely with what Georgia was talking about. And then we'll wrap up with our curiosity of the week before we take a break for 2023. And then we see you in the Falklands when the Oosterskalde Day is there in January. So it looks like we have our classrooms in place. You have 20 seconds for each question. The quicker you put in the right answer, the more points you are going to get. Here we go. First question coming up on the screen in a couple seconds. There we go. True or false? Steamer ducks can be found across North uh, and South America. Is that true uh, or is that false? True or false? Steamer ducks can be found across North and South America. What did we learn about that today? All right, good job, crew. That is absolutely false. They are endemic to South America, particularly Patagonia. Uh, so that region of Argentina and Chile. All right, let's take a look at our leaderboard. The lively bobcat is holding down that top spot. Okay, let's go to our next question. This is another true and false about steamer ducks. Steamer duck chicks are born ready to head right out into the ocean. They don't need time on land like penguins. They're born ready to head right out into the ocean. Is that true? Uh, or is that false about our steamer ducks? 
Had a couple more seconds to lock in that answer. All right, let's see what happened there. Most of us went with true. They are born eyes open. Uh, their parents don't bring them food like penguins, so they've got to go right out into the ocean. What does that do to our board? The charming pe or pigeon, not penguin, pigeon, uh, is there in first place. Here comes a question about fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are formed from, uh, is it crushed rock? Is it the remains of plants and animals? Is it minerals or is it groundwater? So what uh, are fossil fuels formed from? You've got a few answers there to think about. And a couple more seconds to get your answer locked in. All right. So it is the remains of plants and animals. Now these are millions of years old. They're underground under immense pressure, getting crushed uh, under that pressure. And that's where we get uh, our fossil fuels from particularly plants, a lot of plant matter uh, over millions of years. Okay, Charming Pigeon is holding on to that lead. Let's go to our next question. What is the process called when a fossil fuel is burned or a fuel is burned? Is that process combustion? Is it eruption? Is it digestion or is it diffusion? So when we burn a fossil fuel, what do we call it? Like in our engine, sometimes you hear an engine called this kind of engine. All right, good job crew. It is absolutely combustion. So we have our oxygen converted into carbon dioxide, which is our greenhouse gas that goes into the atmosphere. That process combustion is when fuel uh, is burned. I think we have one more question here to wrap up our Kahoot and then we'll take a look at our experiments. All right, Charming Pigeon might hold on till the end. So what gas impacts the shells of animals when it enters the ocean? Is it nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, or oxygen? What is causing ocean acidification? What gas is entering? Nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, uh, or oxygen? Got a few more seconds to lock in your answer. All right, good job crew. It is carbon dioxide. Um, when our fossil fuels are burned, some of it is trapped in the atmosphere, some of it leaves, and then a large portion of it, up to half, is absorbed by the ocean. When that happens though, that uh, leads to ocean acidification, changes the pH, and then shells of coral uh, and structures, or sorry, shells of crabs and things like that, and shells, uh, coral structure dissolves. Okay. Let's take a look at our podium. We have in third place, the hero lobster, very cool. In the second place, we have the joyful dolphin and holding down that top spot, the charming pigeon. All right, if you are the classroom that has the charming pigeon, uh, you need to send me an email. I'm gonna put that email up here uh, right in the event, ebtsoip uh, at gmail.com. So right there, if you are the charming pigeon, if that's your class, ebtsoip at gmail.com, we have a 50 pound Amazon gift card for you. So I mentioned our experiment a couple weeks ago, we grew crest seeds under different conditions to see what would happen. Let's take a look at our results for our growing crest seeds experiment. Welcome back everyone. Let's have a look at the results of our seed germination experiment. As you might remember, we put some cress seeds on a towel in fresh water and exposed it to sunlight. A towel in fresh water covered up with this plate in darkness. And over here, we put some cress seeds on a paper towel with salt water. Well, let's see how the different experiments compare in terms of the germination rates. Well, we can clearly see that the cress seeds with the fresh water exposed to sunlight have germinated very, very well. There's hundreds of little cress plants growing up here. This one here in the middle exposed to dark conditions. Well, these have also grown very well, 
but you can see the cress seeds aren't as green and their long thin stems all have been snaking around in different directions. Last but not least, our saltwater experiment. Well, actually, these ones have barely germinated at all. A few of them have tried to germinate, but none of the seeds really have taken off. And yeah, the ones that have tried to grow don't look very healthy at all. Well, what does this experiment show? Well, clearly, the seeds that have germinated the best are the seeds that have been on the freshwater and the paper towel exposed to sunlight. So clearly, cress needs both fresh water and sunlight in order to grow healthily and the little seedlings to grow strongly. The seeds that have been put in these dark conditions have germinated, but they're not looking that healthy. So this reveals that cress seeds absolutely can germinate just with fresh water without sunlight, but the plants in order to grow healthily need sunlight in order to photosynthesize. Interestingly, if you can imagine when the plate was on the bowl, the seal isn't perfect and a tiny little bit of light would have probably shone in through the sides. And that's reflected in the growth pattern of these little seedlings. You can see them all growing out sideways towards that tiny little bit of light that maybe came through. So it shows two things. Firstly, that cress seeds can germinate even if there's no light or very, very little light. They just need the fresh water in order to be stimulated to do so. But when the seeds germinate, the seedlings search out for light and do their best to grow towards any light source, as we can see here. The reality is, if we kept these little seedlings in the dark, they would eventually starve and die because they need to photosynthesize in order to grow healthily. And that shows the difference between these ones here in the sunlight and these ones here in the darkness. And our last experiment over here has the most traumatic results. Very few of these seeds here that were put in the, the salt water have germinated and the few that have have mostly died or are looking very unhealthy and I think won't survive. So this reveals that clearly salty conditions are not good for cress plants or cress seeds to germinate. Remember that every single different species of plant around the world has different requirements for its seeds to germinate and for its seedlings to grow healthily. Some plants actually like salty conditions. These plants are called halophytes, and if you use the seed of one of those, you'd probably end up with the exact opposite results, where the seeds wouldn't probably grow in fresh water, but would grow very well in the salty conditions. You can repeat this experiment and test different types of seeds. See if you get different results with different species of plants. All right, so there we go. There's the results of our crest seed experiment. Let's take a look at this week's experiment and keep in mind, there will be the holidays. So we will be looking at the results of that when we return in January. So you actually have a bonus week to try the experiment and send your results in. So let's take a look at this week's experiment. Welcome back everyone. In today's experiment, we're going to test the pH of different liquids that you have at home to see if they're acid, neutral or alkaline. The really fun thing about today's experiment is you can make a pH indicator liquid with things that you have in your kitchen at home. All you need is a red cabbage, a blender, some distilled water and some different liquids that you can test. For example, orange juice or bleach or cleaner or soap or shampoo or toothpaste. So let's get started. The first thing you need to do is get a red cabbage and chop off little sections of it. You'll end up with some pieces like this. It's actually surprisingly hard, so be careful with a knife, get a parent or a responsible adult to cut it for you, and then pop them inside the blender, like so. I've used about, well, roughly about a quarter of my red cabbage. It doesn't matter absolutely uh, exactly how much you use. Then get some distilled water. This is important because remember you're testing the pH. So if you use regular tap water, your tap water might have a pH that might be acidic or alkaline. So it's best to use distilled water so you don't have any chemical influence from the tap water from different minerals 
or a substance that's dissolved in your water. If you can, get a responsible adult to heat up your distilled water. I've just brought this, this 400 millilitres of, of distilled tap water to boiling point. So carefully pour that into the blender and then put on the lid and very carefully turn it on. Well, that's some pretty blended cabbage. Next, you have to filter the liquid out of this soup of chopped up cabbage pieces. So you need a little filter paper and funnel and something to filter it in. And this can take a little bit of a time. So you have to be patient with this next step. Pour out some of the liquid into your funnel. And then you just have to let it drain through. And you should be getting a purple liquid down at the bottom coming through. I've left my cabbage soup dripping away and filtering for the last 10 minutes or so. I've had to top it up a few times, but look how much liquid has slowly filtered through. You're now ready to remove the filter. Look at this wonderful purple liquid. This is the extract from the cabbage that we're going to use to look at the pH of different liquids at home. So then use a pipette, or you could just pour it out. I'm going to put in roughly 90 millilitres into each of these test tubes. It doesn't matter if it's absolutely the same or not. There we go. We're now ready to start our tests to see if there's differences in the pH of different liquids that you've got at home. You really can use any liquids that you like. I really recommend trying vinegar, fruit juice, orange juice in particular works really well. I'm also going to test some shampoo, some milk, and last but not least, some drain cleaner. Obviously, if you're using any potentially hazardous chemicals such as this, make sure you do so under the supervision of a responsible adult. The cabbage solution should turn red if the liquids are acidic or bluish if they're alkaline. Run your experiment at home and send in photos at classroom at darwin200.com for a chance to win three £50 Amazon gift voucher prizes. Join me in two weeks' time to see the results of my testing of these five different liquids. Good luck, and I hope your experiment goes well. All right, so for you to try at home your cabbage pH experiment, you have until, let's check the calendar here quickly, the week of January 8th. So we'll likely have that event uh, on January 11th. So you have until January 11th, so a nice big stretch to try this in the classroom or try this at home uh, with your family. Send in your photos to classroom at darwin200.com and our top three results, as always, there will be a 50 pound Amazon gift voucher sent your way. Okay, to wrap up, we have to talk curiosity of the week. So last week's curiosity was kind of strange looking, thorny, hooked uh, object. Let's find out what it was. Back everyone. Last week, I asked you to try and identify this strange object with these really large spikes. Could you work out what it is? I wouldn't blame you if you said it was a type of bone or some sort of strange insect because it has these big defensive spikes. But believe it or not, it's actually the part of a branch of an acacia tree. Many species of acacias produce these really big spikes and these are actually hollow. This particular species has a relationship with ants. If you look very closely right there, there's a little hole. Can you see that? Basically what happens is that there's a relationship with ants that burrow into these spines and use them as nursery chambers for their larvae. If you disturb the acacia tree, the ants often fall down onto the, the animal or the person that's disturbing the tree and they bite. So this incredible plant has two defenses, these big ferocious spikes and the biting ants 
that live inside the spikes. So it's a very well defended plant. Well done if you guessed correctly. And let's see if you can identify this week's curiosity. All right, let's queue up this week's curiosity before we wrap up for 2023. Here we go. Welcome back, everyone. Can you identify this week's curiosity? It's this strange white disc. It has little holes on it. And I'll give you a clue. It lives in the ocean, often near sandy beaches. Join us in one week's time to find out the answer of this strange, curious little object. All right, so there we go. Our challenge for over the holidays is to identify that we got the clue that it's from the ocean. So what is that curiosity? For the experiment, we have until January 11th, when everyone's back in school, send in your photos to classroomofdarwin200.com. If you have a guess for um, the curiosity of the week, send it there uh, as well to the same email address. And you have the same amount of time. Usually it's a week, but because of the holidays, uh, you'll have until we get back. So a huge shout out to the classrooms who joined us today. Thank you to the crew from the ship who joined us and uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust uh, for such a great world's most exciting classroom wrapping up 2023. We will see everybody in 2024, but until then, have an incredible holiday season with your families. We're going to wrap up, as always, with a shout out to our sponsors, our supporters, our partners who make the Darwin 200 and the world's most exciting classroom possible.